Hello again. This uh, is a special recording, what we call an archives recording. And the preceding part of this film was showing some of downtown Denver on the date of, uh, I think it was 18th of April. Today is the 20th of April, year 2000. Denver is still there and there's still traffic and there's still smog. But since it's an archives report, we thought we'd put in a little piece about Denver, showing what Denver is like and the construction of a new stadium, etc. In the archive report, which this is, I wish to add a few things which I would not put in the general history of myself and the Philadelphia experiment. This material will not be available to everyone, in fact, very few people. And going back into the problems of the Philadelphia experiment, when Duncan and I jumped overboard off the ship, the Eldridge, in hyperspace, we, of course, didn't know what was happening and where we were going, or if we were going anywhere, except, of course, into the water. We expected to hit the water in the bay and swim ashore, but no water, we never hit it. We kept falling and falling for quite a period of time. And then it seemed to level out. <coughs> Excuse me. Seemed to level out, and we were, shall I say flying along? That's not the right term, but it seemed like we were. Through cloud banks and other strange phenomena, and this went on for a period of time, and then we blanked out, and we woke up, as we found out, in a hospital, Duncan in one bed and I in another in the same room, and wondering what has happened, where were we, and what was going on. Well, a hospital attendant, an orderly, came in and uh, did the usual measurements of the usual vital signs and so forth. And I said, would you like to watch TV? He said, yes. So we turned on the TV. At this point, we didn't know that anything was wrong or anything was any different than the era, era we had come from. Except, of course, in 1943, we didn't have large screen color TV. This happened to be a wall-mounted unit, smaller size but color, which was the first discrepancy. But we watched the TV. We were actually in that hospital for four weeks recovering. We finally asked what we were doing here. They wouldn't tell us how we got there, but they said, you have suffered severe radiation burns. I said, radiation from what? And they sort of demurred on giving us a straight answer. And they said, no, it's not nuclear radiation. As it turns out, and we learned much later, of course, there was radiation that you will possibly run into in deep space under certain other conditions, which, is, of course, is non-nuclear, but nevertheless, it's an ionizing form of radiation that can be damaging to the body. <clears throat> so we took about four weeks to recover, but in that process, in that time, we watched a lot of television. At that point, I would say after a week of watching TV, I started asking a lot of questions. It was, it was quite obvious that things were not normal. Normal in the sense of how we knew them in 1943. That uh, the indications were there were very few cities uh, around the country anymore. There was uh, rail travel, there was some car travel. But what was most important is there were no longer any national boundaries. There were boundaries for reference. Like, what states do we have in the U.S.? Well, boundaries referenced were in accordance with the American map as we saw it. But we were told very bluntly that no longer is there a government. Whatever is left of it is under military control. <coughs> there were a number of references on television to uh, the changed coastlines. It struck us that they were changed. They didn't say that. We started asking questions. Well, can you give us some maps of the United States? Maybe the United States and Canada. Oh, sure. No problem. They got them for us. We were rather dismayed to find that a good chunk of California was dis had disappeared, was no longer above water, was obviously underwater. The Pacific Ocean was now encroaching on dry land, uh, largely paralleling the San Andreas Fault Line. In San Francisco, a lot of San Francisco was still there. It was not all intact. The principal part that survived was on the Rocky Promontory, which was in the downtown area. South of that, there was a lot of damage, but apparently the damage from the earthquakes and whatever else had hit started at a point someplace between San Francisco and San Jose, as the San Andreas Fault comes in at that point. San Jose, as I remember, was missing. And as you went further south, it was sort of a ragged loss of land. When it got down to Los Angeles, the, shall we say, the cliff area 
of Santa, uh, Santa not San Mateo, the cliff area of <clears throat> the whole section on the beach from Malibu on south was missing. Uh, no cliffs, no apartment houses, no houses. The beaches were further inland, at least from what we thought they were originally. Downtown Los Angeles was essentially intact. It was built on a rocky area. The, the residential sections, other than the high hills of Altadena and some of the higher sections of Beverly Hills, were gone. They were just totally destroyed. And there was not that much left of Los Angeles as a functioning city. Long Beach, I don't recall whether it was still there or not, but I do recall that San Diego was totally gone because the loss of land began just slightly south of Los Angeles and went on inland on a rather ragged line so that the, again, approached the San Andreas Fault, which, of course, runs through the Salton Sea in the southern part of California on down into Mexico. At that point, roughly from Laguna Beach or someplace a little north of it, on down to so the Salton Sea was all gone. It was underwater, the land was gone, and there were severe changes, shall we say, in that area. Nothing as severe as the Gordon Michael Scallion map. Nowhere near as severe, because he showed most of California gone, and most of Arizona gone, parts, or greater parts of uh, Nevada gone, none of that. But up north, there was severe damage in the, in the Bay Area of uh, Seattle. In Portland, I don't recall specifically whether that was still there or not. Chicago was gone. The Great Lakes were now one lake. Speaking, of course, of the year in which we finally found out what year we were in, was 2137 A.D. And the Mississippi had undergone drastic changes. It had become a very wide waterway and an inland estuary at the narrowest point, about 30 miles wide. As you went on south to New Orleans, the whole sand strip and the whole sand spit where New Orleans once was was gone, as was the city of New Orleans. And then we found out that there was a swath of land about 50 miles wide across the entire Gulf area, the entire Gulf Coast, which was underwater. Well, this meant all of the coastal cities were gone. That included Houston. It included uh, El Paso, Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas. They were all underwater and gone. Most of the Texas north of that 50-mile swath was still there. Dallas, as I recall, was still intact. But the Mississippi problem was enormous because when it got down to the Gulf, it wasn't 30 miles wide anymore, it was over 100. And there was an attempt made, apparently successful, to build a bridge across the narrowest point of the new Mississippi, which was 30 miles wide, and they did build what became the world's largest and longest suspension bridge <clears throat> across that point on the Mississippi that was still crossable. I asked other questions, like what about the East Coast? Well, the East Coast had some very strange changes. There was a large chunk of land missing from Georgia. <coughs> Georgia was peculiarly hit in that the cities of Savannah were gone, the coastal cities were gone. <coughs> Atlanta was still there, but three miles approximately from the ocean front. And the cutout of land was rather jagged, pointing towards Atlanta, but then went back towards the coast. And as you go on up the coast towards New York, the losses were very strange and they were sporadic and they went out on a continuous thing. It was a jagged outline. Baltimore and Washington were gone. New York City was still there and what was left of it, which was mostly the uh, section above the battery on Manhattan Island because it's solid rock, it remained. And the areas like Brooklyn and Queens were essentially gone and replaced by water. And most of Long Island was intact. New England, there's some missing land areas. And, <clears throat> as I said, Chicago was gone. Upstate New York had a very strange problem. The St. Lawrence River became an inland seaway and developed a lake which covered Albany, New York, a large saltwater lake. So there were a lot of strange changes in the United States. Canada, I did not pay any particular attention to. It didn't appear to have changed that much. Europe had drastic changes. In Europe, England was gone. Most, but not all, of Ireland was gone. The highlands of Scotland was still alive and well, apparently. And in terms of the internal country and parts of Europe, as we know it now, uh, quite a bit of it was underwater. Even parts of Switzerland were underwater. The mountains had dropped that far. What all had gone on in Europe, we don't really know. 
And the guys I asked the questions of couldn't really answer them correctly anyway, because they were not that familiar with it. The man I principally talked with was a hospital technician, quite intelligent. And during our stay there, he was the only black man we saw. He was a black medical technician, very competent and educated. He was the only black person we saw on our entire stay in the year 2137. Well, there was still rail travel, land travel. I didn't ask about airlines travel. But I happened to ask, what's the world population these days? And they said, oh, slightly over 300 million. And I looked at him and I said, world population? He said, yes, world population. So the U.S. is now, now down around 50 million or less. There's no government left acting on the face of the earth intact. They had all crumbled sometime between the period of 2000 and, as uh, he told me, 2025. Martial law was set in in almost all these areas. There was a combination of, and historically speaking, of a nuclear war, World War III, that was considered a rather brief World War III, but a lot of destruction, and then there was natural earth changes, which were more destructive than the war. Between all of those, there was a great loss of life, a loss of government, a loss of transportation, and of course, for that, you have starvation and other problems. And it went continually downhill from about 2003 is my guess, and he didn't specify a date. He said the records were hazy, but it looked like 2004 approximately when things came apart. And at that point, he said the, what was left of the government under military control was attempting to rebuild the nation. And this was in 2137. They said it was well along to being rebuilt, but it was far from being completely rebuilt and the destruction being uh, replaced and over. So that was rather a, a strange interlude and rather a shock. Why we wound up there, I have no idea. It certainly was not our idea. And who, shall we say, engineered this little trip into the year 2137 is still unknown to me. I have some ideas as to who it might be, but it gets into a little later part of the dissertation and discussion of what happened. I asked about uh, levels of science and technology. Oh, yes. He said nothing was lost during this whole period of the Earth destruction and the Earth upheavals and the war. He said we still have computers, we have TV, we have all kinds of communications. I didn't ask him about uh, space travel or what was going on in terms of what was once NASA. I didn't think to ask him about that because I was, shall we say, preoccupied with the otherwise Earth changes and the, the total shift in the size of civilization and uh, its structure. I asked about money and banks. He says, oh, yes, there's still money. They said the banks are a lot smaller than they were, and they're not as active. And watching TV, you know, I think about it, I didn't see a single ad about anything. So there was some major changes. Now, we stayed there approximately six weeks. I'm saying we, Duncan and myself. We did get up out of bed eventually and move around. But before the next phase began, I'll have to say that I thought we were stuck there perhaps forever without the slightest idea of how we got there in the first place, and they couldn't explain it either. We suddenly appeared someplace where they picked us up unconscious, we turned in to an ambulance crew, and they took us to a hospital. And we were in uniform, so they knew we were military personnel, but the military had changed drastically in the meantime, and the military of that era had no particular interest in us. Uh, one day, wandering around that hospital and hospital grounds, I disappeared from that era and from 2137, and I wound up in a still further future date. By what means, who arranged it, who provided the transportation, I don't know. It was obviously a form of time travel. And the interesting thing about it was that Duncan was not with me. He remained behind at 2137, as I found out later. I wound up in the 28th century, and this was in a time period of uh, 2749 to 2751 AD. Talk about changes in civilization, society, and everything else. It was drastically changed from what we saw in 2137, as this is now 600 years later. The cities were enormous. The cities were beautiful. They had ground-based cities, much as we have always had them. But they also had something else, floating cities. Floating cities due to anti-gravity techniques being perfected sufficiently that they could float an entire city, which was perhaps not as large as any of our current cities. It was round, or very nearly round. But it floated on this platform, and they could move the city any place they wanted. 
remaining floating in the air, four or 5,000 feet above the ground perhaps, or a little less, depending on what they wanted. But the size of the city was vertical rather than horizontal, 2,200 stories high. That's about two and a half miles. And I learned about this and looked at it and I said to myself, because I befriended some people in the 28th century, <coughs> how do they support this? The strength of materials and anything we know, and I'm sure in this era, is inadequate to withstand the load of all of those stories above the ground of the lowest level. And I said, quite true. I said, well, how do you do it? And I said, well, very simply, it's about every 300 floors, we put another anti-gravity platform which relieve, relieves the weight of all of those sections above on the section below, and they do this for every 300 stories or so, and you break it up into 300 story sections, which is not impossible by even today's strength of materials, but by a future strength of materials and advances, no problem whatever. So they would divide it up, and the weight load was only on one level, and then below it was independent in terms of load, though they were all well attached. And by that means, they suspended the load into a distributed form, which made it very feasible. The cities could move anywhere on the planet. Basically, they stayed hovering and floating. Or if they didn't like a particular location, they moved somewhere else. There wasn't that much traffic in moving cities, I can assure you, because the world population in that era, in the 28th century, was only 500 million. And I was instructed later that that was where they had held it for centuries. There would be no more than approximately 500 million population. Some of the features of this Let's, let's start from the political standpoint. As I learned, all of these cities, whether they're ground-based cities, of which the majority were, because they had to do manufacturing, they had to have agriculture and various other things to supply the needs of civilization. But all of them, whether floating or ground-based, were rather interesting in their governmental form. They had essentially no government. There was no government as we know it today. There was no money, there was no banks, there was no political jurisdictions. And it was it resulted, uh, resolved down to what would be best called a city-state structure, where the city is the state. And any other cities up from that one are independent and operate in their own independent manner. So that was the major change there. There was no elected government, there was no appointed government. There was no government as we had ever seen it in the past. As I found out, each city was run by an intelligent computer, synthetic intelligence, uh, synthetic consciousness, a highly radioactive crystalline structure. Who built them, I had no idea, nobody seemed to know, but they've been there for hundreds of years. And this computer ran the entire city. There were guidelines set down, there were laws, law books, but no courts. There were guidelines set down as to how you were to behave, what your parameters were, within these parameters, if anything went, anything was not considered a kosher within this realm of this parameter limit, would be expressed as a yellow zone, a zone that you don't want to go into and you don't want to become involved in that type of behavior. If you got out of that area, you were given an invite for a reprimand to the computer, which there was one in every city, running each city, to where you would literally be called in for, a, shall we say, an interview or an audience with a computer, and it would, you would be advised that you had uh, broken the law, but it wasn't considered a felony, it was a misdemeanor, a misdemeanor and such. If you were judged guilty, you were sent off to one of the work camps. For whatever purpose uh, they did in the work camps, it would be much like today, I presume, where any kind of labor, menial or otherwise, had to be done, was done. And that was compulsory, that was not voluntary. If you were called in because you had gone outside the yellow zone into what is called the red zone, which is basically what you would today call a felony offense, you were immediately called in for an interview. You were examined, looked at, talked to. And if the computer at that point thought that you were rehabilitable, that you could learn again to be sociable and within the social bounds, of normalcy, you were given one more chance. If the computer decided that you were not capable of fitting into society, you were, you were terminated right then and there. Now, there were other people who didn't feel like they could fit into the society, 
but had not yet committed any of the so-called offenses, literally they were allowed to leave. The, the word was, if you don't like it here, go. Go live somewhere else. Go out in the boonies if you want. Live as a hermit. We don't care. And many did. I do not know what percentage. I was told that quite a lot of people had left the cities and gone out in the, in the boondocks. Whether they formed communities or not, I never did find out. The technology was so advanced on that that you had for transportation within the city what they called accelerons. Consider it very much like a moving walkway as we have today, except that when you got on it, you could literally jump ahead and move in a form of suspended gravity at a very high rate of speed along this beltway. And when you got to a point where you wanted to get off, you just literally jumped off. And the kids love to play with these, this sort of toy. They considered it a toy. And to some extent, they were always getting in the way, but <clears throat> to them, it was great fun. As these accelerons went across, even in the sky cities, across open spaces. In the interior of the city structure, there was a fairly large open space. Eventually, I got my turn to talk with the computer. It was uh, part of what was called the Lama system. Now, why that name was chosen, I don't know. But it was a fact that every one of those computer installations, though independent, was tied together on a network not known by most of the city dwellers, which included every city on the planet. So that there was cohesion between the computers, uh, cooperation, and generally they kept track of each other. I spent almost two years in this very large complex. I traveled around a lot. One of the other things was, yes, there were rails, there were railroads, but they had changed a lot. They were now for the purpose of excursion, having fun. And uh, go out in one of these excursions, uh, it was a big party. The rail was much wider than our current rail system, perhaps two to two and a half times wider to accommodate a much larger car, much wider. And with that, of course, they had literally rolling dining rooms, rolling ballrooms, and could have a uh, great time and great fun, literally traveling from one city to the other, with no other purpose other than having fun and uh, taking a trip somewhere. If you weren't required to work, which no one was required to, other than their social obligation, which was well inculcated into the kids, that you had an obligation to d contribute to society to pay for what you have been using and had inherited, for which no money was involved. A sort of credit system was still functional. But otherwise, you know, except for fairly large credit purchases, if that is the right term, uh, they didn't really keep track of very much. It was considered quite free as long as you were able to make some contributions and uh, nobody overloaded the system with demands. That happened very seldom, that there was an overload of demand for goods or services. So as a result of that, there was very little abuse of the system. Now, in this period of time, talking with many people, making friends, uh, I had a number of questions. Who built this computer system? That was my first and foremost question. Who maintains it? Uh, what happens when it breaks down? Very common questions. Uh, no common answer. Uh, and very much uncommon answers. First question about <coughs> the cities, who built them, who maintains them, who maintains the computers, was rather hard to answer and get an answer to. No one really knew much about the history of the construction of the city or how it ran, other than the computer, and you couldn't request an interview. You couldn't request to go in and ask questions. If it wasn't busy with something else, you know, okay, come on in. But an understanding, of course, that this was a highly radioactive device, it was a radioactive crystal and structure, you had to wear the equivalent of a lead suit, a radiation suit, much like NASA has today, except there was some lead material added to make sure that you were not affected by the hard radiation. So you can go in and have an interview and ask a lot of questions, and I did more than once. I got some answers. I would say they were always satisfactory. But I did find out eventually that a number of interesting things, while there was no longer a military, and I'm speaking of the 28th century, in any of the city structures and any of the data information of this computer complex, because they did interconnect and did, just like uh, an email net or another computer complex, there were a lot of people on the line giving information and taking information. <coughs> Uh, 
the aspect of how these computers communicated with each other was unknown. But it did make, the one I talked with did make a number of interesting statements over a period of time. They have been around for about 200, 250 years in this format, in this system. There was no uh, one to do any maintenance. Apparently there was no maintenance as such. If one of them broke down, it was simply replaced. But I wasn't satisfied with some of these answers. I started looking further. Didn't find much for a while. Then all of a sudden I got an invite to come visit with another group, a human group, which I did. And then I found the answers to all of my questions, all of the questions I had in mind they were able to answer. Number one, who built the computer system? Well, they said they did. And the project was started about 2600 AD, and it was a, basically an experimental system for the purpose of seeing if they could run an entire civilization by computer and also provide full socialization, i.e. everything is free, but also in the educational system or process inculcate the idea that people have a moral obligation to do something for the community because the community had supported them, therefore they have to help support others in the community, which did work most of the time. In a smaller community, it works much better than in a larger community. If you get cities well over a million population, it's very difficult to get something like this to work and to be usable on a consistent basis. Well, that was one of the questions I had, and there were a lot of others. I asked about uh, the military aspects. No, there were no, was no more military. Well, how do you defend yourself in case somebody comes along? That's a lot of, a lot of hardware, a lot of munitions, a lot of military clout and wants to take over a city or the whole planet. How do you prevent this, or do you? Well, the answer was rather complex, but basically, basically it came down to the fact that they had hidden weapon systems in the cities, and not every installation was a city, but they had all of these installations all over, and <clears throat> they were well concealed. They were not described to me as exactly what they were, but they said they were ca capable of deflecting and defending a city from an invasion from outer space. And there was no data given as to whether or not there had been any such uh, attempted takeovers in the past. <clears throat> but at that time, we saw nothing resembling any kind of, of an attack, any kind of a threat. It was very peaceful. And it was perhaps because of that peacefulness that uh, people were basically so happy there. It was, you might say, the end result of a long dream about a pure socialist state. They had it, and it seemed to work. There was only one fault with it that I saw, and this is uh, something which I have discerned since I've been back, after many years. You get a city or a group which is purely socialistic, no money. Uh, how do you keep that group together? How do you keep the society together? Um, in that case, you're looking at a situation where it's partly by the will of the people, partly by, shall I say, some kind of internal control, and partly because one could say there's a little choice. If you don't want to live in the city, you go out in the boonies. If you don't know how to survive by yourself, you stay in the city. Survival skills are not something that was commonly taught in those days because all the technical problems of breakdown of equipment have long since been solved, and the equipment's generally were working and continue to work for about 200 years without much maintenance. The maintenance that was required was definitely directed by the intelligence in the computer. Systems existed for doing repairs and maintenance. And of course, if they had manufacturing systems, they had to have maintenance systems to service the manufacturing equipment. All of what was manufactured, I don't know. There was definitely a lot of agriculture. In the, surf in the on the surface, in the periphery, basically, of some of the surface cities, some of the agriculture went outside the city limits, outside the periphery of the city, but not a lot. They seemed to produce more than enough food for what they needed, which was good. There was no problems or threats or food shortages. The idea of a threat to the survival in a civilized society had long since faded because the people were so well cared for. But the here is also a problem. 
These people were well cared for by a socialist system. They didn't have to work to do anything, even though they were expected to work and expected to contribute to society. It was not demanded. The things I saw in the society and civilization were at first unique to me. And I would say with not only without precedent, I had no comparison, no basis from the memories of the 20th century. Because at the time of my arrival, my memory of the 20th century was wiped out. All of the comparisons I have done have come since because at this point I'm able to compare what I saw at that time with what I know, of course, of the 20th century. But it was sort of strange in that I didn't know really why I was there. I didn't know that I had any connection with the Philadelphia Experiment or anything else in the past. But there I was, wandering around the city as one of the regular inhabitants, occasionally taking trips out of the city, which were a lot of fun, and meeting this group who built the computer system. Now, as they told me, this was an experimental system, uh, a sort of an experiment in social behavior, not necessarily behavior modification, but social behavior to see whether they could build a city and have it be run by a computer after setting down certain parameters of what you do or don't do in a society in which you have a city or even a smaller community. It was obvious to them, as it was to me, that the experiment was largely working. But my questions in retrospect, meaning from the viewpoint of now and from what they told me also, Yes, it is an experiment, but they do not know if it'll succeed. Because one of the problems which develops when you have pure socialism like that, which is working, and that everything seems to be running smoothly, you have no incentive. No one has an incentive to go out and do something new. Nobody has an incentive which says you must try something like this to make a, a better living, so to speak. You didn't have to make a living. Everything was provided. You didn't have to get an education. And this, of course, put it at that point already, uh, a severe a severe restriction on original research because people weren't interested in doing it. So they didn't. And eventually, the society appears, uh, it fell apart. But certainly it was at its peak point, I would say, right around that time, 20, 2900 AD, and probably was for some time after that. But the group that designed and built this system built all of the computer link-ups and occasionally one would go bad, because I was there just before I left for one, I'd gone sour and it was removed at a later date, I believe. But I did learn the name of this group of people who were the, essentially the designers of the whole system, the computer system, the city structures, the city setup. They call themselves the Wingmakers. Now, some of you may have heard of the Wingmakers group. It certainly has turned up on 20th century computers, 20th century runs, and a lot of data has been turned out, hundreds of pages in some of the manuals, describing the discovery of their stash in New Mexico in about 1974, in which the only thing they found which was out of place for an 8th century AD Indian burial mound, or Indian burial of whatever, the item that was out of, totally out of context was a compass. It resulted in NSA becoming involved with this, descending on the site, sealing it off, and looking to see if possibly what they were looking at was actually an alien type of installation, an alien crash, or whatever. They did not ever find any evidence of aliens. In fact, they didn't find enough evidence to support any thesis. So they closed it down, and after an earthquake in about the year uh, 1994, approximately, a wall disappeared due to the earthquake, and they had a tunnel, an artificial-looking tunnel, which went to a circular staircase carved right in the rock, which was quite obviously artificial, and 23 rooms off that staircase in a long tunnel, all of which contained relics of some civilization that was advanced, paintings, and in the last room, the 23rd room, was a laser disc, an actual optical disc, much like what we have today, except the coding in it was such that it could not be decoded. Make a long story short, it took a year and a half of one of the experts there in languages, there were 20 languages, and so ancient Sumerian, and somehow got the clues from the pictures on the walls, 23 rooms, 23 pictures, all paintings, and all in good shape. They finally cracked the optical disc, and they who had made the disc and left it there stated very clearly that they had left this stash in 800 AD, approximately, 8th century, 
And uh, there were six more like it around the Earth, seven total. The object was for man to dig these up when he got to the point where technically he could do it and understand what was there and learn their concerns about civilization. Well, one has been found. That was in New Mexico. There are six more. There are rumors that a second one has been found. But, of course, the first one was totally under the control of NSA, National Security Agency. Underneath the basic organization was another one called ACIO, Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization. They are the ones who apparently pull all of the rare and exotic research involving uh, finds which might look like aliens, but proved in this case not to be. It was a time travel operation. And that is the group which is set aside to do it, and there's a special group within ACIO known as the Wingmakers Group, which was working on this project and keeping it very, very secret. They identified the group that was some, as having come from the 28th century, originating in the 28th century. They called themselves the Wingmakers, which is what I remember, and they were interactive with this time period also. That is the 20th century into the 21st century. They did not give me any indication at the time when I was in the 20th century that they were interactive with the 20th century, but I got the distinct impression that I had not seen the last one from the various things they said. I have not seen them since, I might add, not in any physical sense, unless it was by accident, because there was no communication, and it might have been an instance where I saw some of their people, three of them, in a men's health club on one Sunday afternoon in Atlanta about two years ago. No communication with anyone, not even communicating between themselves. The group was telepathic. And whether it was them or not, I don't know, but I have a suspicion. They were too genetically perfect to have been of this time and this era, so they could have been. But since then, the indications have been via the internet and that information which was dropped on the net, two interviews out of five that have been given by Dr. Anderson, a pseudonym, but one of the senior workers with the language capability that cracked the optical disc, found an outside person to take some interviews, five in all, and translate them into a material which could be put on the internet. He wanted the material out. Well, two got out and some other material and that was the last I've ever seen or heard of either and or Dr. Anderson. There's no answer at this point as to whether or not those two people are still alive or dead, what's happened to them, and the other three interviews have never appeared on the Internet. There's enough that has appeared to make a very substantial story and a very substantial uh, indications that these guys were not flakes. The section on uh, philosophy alone is enough to really stir one. And the pictures are very, very strange. According to those who found them on the walls, they were still in very good condition repairs. This is from the 8th century to the 20th century, which is uh, 1,200 years. And there's been, there was very little deterioration. For that matter, there's very little dust in the rooms. But they found some means to protect them further. I mean, the CIA does have some rather advanced technologies available to them and NSA. And they uh, made some further attempt to preserve the paintings. What they did, I don't know. But what is interesting is that the other stashes have yet to turn up. And they insisted from this one optical disc that there were six more, and when the time was right, they'd all be found. Uh, they were very concerned about the survival of humanity throughout this very critical period of history, meaning the 20th century into the 21st century. Now, in retrospect, looking back at them and the things they said, and what I now remember, they were not convinced, in my view, that the socialist experiment was a success. It was a success to a very, very certain degree in terms of the local time period and the local era, and perhaps in terms of what problems had developed prior to their starting this experiment, i.e. the collapse of, or near collapse of civilization and trying to rebuild in the period after 2137, 22nd century up through the 26th. I had no indication of the history in that period as to what transpired. Nothing was discussed with me. I got the impression that it was not exactly uh, in very good shape. There may have been other problems that developed in the interim, but by that time of the 26th century, they got a handle on synthetic intelligence, and they decided to go ahead and rebuild civilization using what they called the Lama system, the system of intelligence, created in a crystalline form, consciously aware, and having certain other abilities which would normally be classed as metaphysical. These computers were able to do things which perhaps some of our, our best gurus would have trouble doing. Manipulation of matter, manipulation of time, 
by these computers. So they were not unintelligent. They were very intelligent. But they had no ethics or morality as we understand them and as we uh, use them. So my question to myself, or perhaps to anyone else, is are these guys looking now, perhaps, for another solution? Obviously, we learned in this century that if there is no competitive spirit, if there is no desire to succeed, if there's no pressure on an individual to learn, to do something constructive, to succeed, to help build some little corner, a brick or two in our civilization, without that pressure, people don't do anything. And if you suddenly wind up in a situation where all of your needs and wants are granted for free and you don't have to go out and work for them, you don't have to do something to go get them, you don't have to cut down trees, go out and skin animals for their furs to survive, but suddenly everything is handed to you on a silver platter. Yeah, at first it seems great. And will work for a while. But after a period of time, it's going to fall apart. And I think they were at the point where they were beginning to realize that this was going to happen. Now, from that point, after nearly two years, I was told I had to go back. And I said, go back where? What for? He says, well, you came out of the past, and there are certain problems back there that were unresolved, and you have to go back and solve them. And I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't at that point remember my involvement at the Philadelphia Experiment. That was brainwash number one, if you will. And the uh, llama, the local one, kept insisting, you must go back. And I said, I don't want to. He said, you will go back. And I did. But before I left, during that two-year period, I met somebody who became a very close companion. He happened to be a tour guide, because there were a lot of tours in those days. And tour guides, of course, were necessary to take people around and show them the sights and show them some of the old cities. New York City was a museum, if you will, as were some other of the old cities from the 20th century, those that survived. And uh, they made very nice museums out of them. New York was uh, sort of the model to show how people lived in the 20th century. Uh, a great deal of it. I did go on that tour. A great deal of it was still intact, most of Manhattan. Not all of it. Uh, Brooklyn and Queens were essentially uh, destroyed, and they didn't make any attempt to rebuild it because the destruction was uh, too heavy. But the concrete and steel of New York, of Manhattan, and some of the other buildings adjacent to Manhattan survived, and what little damage there was was repaired, and they made a very nice museum of it. You could go through it and tour it, see the underground subway systems. I don't think they were, op as I remember, they were not operational. But everything was there. Made a very interesting review of history from the standpoint of those of the 28th century. What we take for granted today, of course, they didn't. And at that point, I did not have my memory of the 20th century, but as time went on, it came back after I left the 28th century. They said I had to go back, so I was sent back. And of course, this raises the question, were they the ones who brought me up there in the first place? I certainly didn't have any how it were handy to do it. I certainly had no desire to go to the 20th century. I knew nothing about it. So I went back to 2137, and Duncan was there. And uh, I was imbued with the idea we had to go back. I had no idea how we were going to go back, and I wasn't even sure at that point where. But we did go back. We were sent back to 1983, the, two, the early morning hours, approximately 2 a.m. of 12 August 1983, inside the chain link fence at Montauk Point. And this searchlight came down from a large helicopter, and MPs, uh, quite a number, came out and grabbed us and took us to the building. Where when we boarded, an elevator went down below, and then of course met Dr. John van Neumann. At the point of our return, however, that is to 1983, a great deal of the memory of the other elements came back. At this point, I'm still not sure how much of it came back, but quite a bit of it did. And when we were returned to the Eldridge by the crew and the system at Montauk, nearly the time tunnel, and we're back in the Eldridge, and it was back in the harbor, and we wound up in our, that is, I wound up in the four-day uh, board of inquiry. Duncan jumped overboard and went back to the later part of that century, the 20th century. But after giving my report, of course, I was not believed. In retrospect, I can understand why I was not believed. It was who, in the year 1983, is going to believe a story about uh, 1943 is going to believe a story about 1983, much less about further on in the future than that. It would be hard enough to understand 1983. It's only 40 years. 
but enormous changes took place, far more than would ever have been normally expected. And let us say the mental projection of what comes on after 1943. Nobody expected such rapid development of aircraft, of automobiles, of highways, of freeway systems, of electronics, of computers. Of course, in 1983, computers were not in the form to any extent of personal computers, as is today the case in the year 2000. But nevertheless, computers existed, and they were proliferating in every way and every respect. But then to add a story about 2137, I'm sure that was a little bit too much. They thought I was a little bit ill and I had gotten some radiation sickness. Nobody said that because I gave a very coherent report, but I'm sure they might well have been thinking it. Duncan was not there to back me up, unfortunately, and he went on back to the year 1983, late 82, early 83, we're not sure. I say I'm not sure because those records we didn't dig out until after the Montauk project collapsed. I was in the 90s, 95, 96, we were able to find out what happened to Duncan. The rest of the story of Duncan we were able to finally piece together was rather bizarre in its own way. When Duncan and I were sent back to the Elders to destroy the equipment, which we did, and the fields were collapsing, it took over two minutes for them to totally collapse, and we found the two sailors buried in the steel of a deck and the steel of a bulkhead from the other two. And I went over to talk with his brother Jim, who was crying and dying, and did die. Duncan became so dismayed by all of this that he headed for the railing. I looked back at me like, well, aren't I coming along with him? And I applied no, so he jumped overboard. And as we found out later, he wound up back in Montauk, not at the same point in time, 12 August 83, but considerably earlier, and became part of the project and did a lot of work for them. And the records indicated, that is the records after the year 1983, that in one of the time tunnel operations that he was involved in, he uh, did a no-no, something that was strictly forbidden. He said, for reasons they didn't understand, occasionally side tunnels developed, and their orders were never to go down the side tunnels, because they didn't know why they were created, how they were created, or where they went. And the order was, don't take a chance, don't go down them. Well, you don't say that to Duncan, not as he was then. So he did go down with the side tunnels, and wound up in the hands of aliens. And they demanded of him that we want a certain piece of hardware, uh, like what? Now they told him, there's a certain power package, a crystal, aboard that UFO, which is uh, buried in the underground there as part of the Montauk project. We want that crystal back. And Duncan says, well, I don't have anything to do with it. And he says, well, you will go back and get it, or you will send somebody back to get it. And frankly, we'll just keep you here and hope that somebody finds out you're missing and sends another person here, and we'll give them the message. So eventually the message got back at uh, Duncan had a problem, and that uh, the solution was to remove that large crystal, an energy storage crystal, and the UFO, it was, and it was delivered there, and Duncan was released. But by that time, the damage had been done. His time locks had been broken, and he was aging at an extremely rapid rate. Now, you may ask, what is a time lock? We're referring to that ambiguous item, which involves how is a person, a new soul, or an old soul, doesn't matter, that is, a taking possession of a body that is in the process of being generated from the fetus onward, how do they lock into that particular body? Well, there is a connecting link, but there's also a connecting link to that point in the time stream as the reference point that this is where the person's life begins, both physically and in terms of the attachment of the soul. Uh, when the body, the body's gone and the soul is free, they can travel up and down the time stream if they want to and take... Uh, a body at some other time frame than the next slot, so to speak, after they died. And occasionally this happens. But in any case, Duncan wound up dying, slowly but surely, aging very rapidly. The station personnel and those who were able to do age reversal, and already had that equipment there because they used it on me later, apparently couldn't reverse him fast enough to keep it from overwhelming them, and in spite of their best efforts, he was continuing to age. So time tunnel to the rescue, namely Montauk, back to locate father and warn him and tell him that uh, Duncan was dying. You can't have this happen because of the time stability problems. Get busy and uh, make another Duncan. So he married his fifth wife, a legal war marriage. <clears throat> First job born was a sister and the second one was Duncan. That was in June 28, 1951. <coughs> now for some very complex reasons, 
the soul of Duncan could not enter that body directly at that time of birth. Normally that's what happens. Uh, that is most of the time. Uh, could not. So they had to have a surrogate soul. And there's a surrogate soul was found to inhabit that body as a perfectly normal functioning body, which it did. And Duncan number two went to school, acted like a very bright youngster. I have pictures of him in that pay, uh, phase at that time. Um, Duncan does not want them to be shown publicly now. And he grew up to the age of 12. And according to information acquired later, at the age of 12, on the 12th of August, 1963, the surrogate soul was kicked out and the real Duncan came in. His mother had reported a very sharp change in the personality at, in the time period, the age of 12 in, in uh, July, August. And uh, that, of course, didn't mean anything to us until, it was like reverse engineering, we reverse engineered what happened to Duncan. And we found out rather in, in a strange, but actually very uh, conclusive way when the project collapsed in 1983, Duncan was off of it, I was off of it, Preston, many other people. But Duncan had a lot of psychological problems as a result of his involvement with the Montauk Project and the Montauk Boys. And eventually he came to seek help from someone he was told could help him, namely Preston Nichols. Now at this point, of course, he had been brainwashed, that is, uh, debriefed, just as had Preston, as had I, as had everybody else who survived that operation. And he didn't know Preston when he walked in the door. Preston didn't know Duncan. But he says, uh, first of all, he had some hi-fi equipment he wanted fixed, which Preston was in the business of doing. And then the matter of discussions that went on after that point, Preston asked him a few questions and uh, says, well, it sounds like you uh, have some problems. Uh, if you're willing, we'll try some deprogramming and we'll try some hypnosis on you. So about 1986, they hypnotized Duncan and took him back from gradually from the period of the Montauk Project to the age of 12, which everything seemed to be normal, uh, as normal as going to be expected, hung together, and so forth. Then they took Duncan back and said, let's go earlier. Well, they did a quantum leap jump to the decks of the Eldridge. This is what was reported to me by Preston after the hypnosis session. And was on the deck and he says, I'm on some strange ship called the Eldridge. And so there are people here that I know today. And I says, one of them is Al Bielik. And he named some others, it didn't mean anything to me. And the aspect of the Montauk Boys program. But at least we had determined what had happened to the Duncan. We knew that I met at that time as Al Bielik was essentially the same Duncan, except that there was a body change. And by the same father, the body came out very nearly the same, a different mother. But that uh, was a long and harrowing experience, trying to dig all that out, and we did. Preston, of course, was having problems with his own memories. And to this day, he has asked for help, and he says, I don't know anybody who can deprogram me. I can deprogram everybody else, but who's going to deprogram me? He says, I want to get clear of this also. That was a very interesting statement on his part, and of course, today he doesn't do too much about it because he's had to drop all the deprogramming efforts because he got into, uh, shall we say, some difficulty with the military over some of his deprogramming efforts with some of the local boys and the sailors and the military people and non-military people on the Long Island area. He had quite a reputation, at present, I mean, and people sought him out. Now, today he won't do any deprogramming, he's in other areas. Now, let's get on to some other things here, which I want to include in this uh, report, or shall I say, this whole thing of my history. There's another element I'm not going into, into an appropriate depth. When I was removed from Los Alamos laboratories and reassigned to the Pentagon, and of course went to Muroc, now Edwards Air Force Base, and was a witness to the Mach 1 proceedings, the Mach 1 test, which was successful, as I had stated, on 28 October 1947, I met Jack Ridley, who was a uh, aeronautical engineer with a uh, master's degree from Caltech, was also a pilot in the Army, and of course eventually became the Army Air Force. And in about 1947, they were just changing over to the official U.S. Air Force. I got to know him quite well. We talked a great deal about this problem of propulsion, high-speed aircraft and such. And we were discussing the aspects of future travel, such as in space. And we came to the conclusion, you know, rockets are fine for short periods of time. They're very powerful, but they are very short-lived. They don't last long. 
NASA has made them work amazingly well, but it's still the same story and basic principle. A lot of power for a relatively short period of time. How do you conduct long extended explorations in space? Now this is without any consideration of the Montauk tunnel situation or anything like that, which at that point we knew nothing about because it hadn't yet happened. I'm speaking of course in 1947 and 48. We became good friends and we both hatched up an idea what we need to develop is an ion propulsion engine. Well, we were convinced it would work. We were both physicists, and he had the advantage of also being an aeronautical engineer, and he liked the idea. So he went back to his principles in the Air Force, and I went back to mine in the Navy at the Pentagon, and gave a pitch as to what we thought would be some of the future engines, future propulsion systems, particularly for space exploration, and we thought we could develop one. Well, both the Navy and the Air Force loved the idea, and uh, they gave us some money, says, go ahead and acquire a facility, we'll fund it see what you can do, and put us on executive leave. I don't know now why we made the decision to go to California, but Edwards is in eastern California, and we liked the idea of perhaps something closer to the ocean. We wound up acquiring a facility which is uh, about half a mile east of Coast 101, which is, say, about a half a mile east of the beach, and uh, it was up in an area which was at that time extremely open. One of the roads led up into the canyon country. Topanga Canyon specifically, and this beach road was where we built the facility. We started operations about 49, without going into the history of the failures, of which there were many, and uh, we had a small staff, it was all paid for by the military. By 1952, it looks like we were getting somewhere, and in January 1953 we had the first fully successful test. We had an engine on the test stand which reduced 1,200 pounds thrust for 20 minutes, and our goal was 1,000 pounds thrust for 10 minutes. Well, we exceeded it. I decided we're going to let the engine run all day to see if it would. It didn't. One of the ion feeds broke down after 20 minutes. We had to shut it down. Even though this was a very highly classified project, the word got around to the industry, the aircraft industry, of course. And Douglas of Long Beach was ecstatic. They wanted to work with us. I don't know what they had in mind, but they did definitely like what we had done and wanted to work with us. Martin Aircraft on the East Coast, which was a well-known aircraft company at that time and still exists, though it has merged with Lockheed, uh, were, shall we say, really gruff, no comment. Boeing heard about it and they hit the roof. Well, when we got the feedback on that one, we figured, well, they must have something of their own in the skunk works, their own skunk works, and probably we beat them to the draw. Appears on the scene at that point, my father, the natural father, Alexander Duncan Cameron Sr., whose life has been a great mystery, and only in the last year have we been able to put together some of the missing pieces. At that time, I had almost none of the missing pieces, other than we know he disappeared for long periods of time. And superimposing knowledge from now on what happened then, I uh, will say when he approached us and said to us, I like what you're doing, incorporate, and I will give you unlimited funding. He says, if you ever get this company off the ground, you will undoubtedly make a great deal of money, and this will become a, a multi-million <coughs> multinational company. So he was all for backing it. And his source of funds was a strange organization called the Wolfsburg Trust. That's W-O-L-F-S-B-U-R-G Trust out of Wolfsburg, Germany. Founded by Dr. Hans Porsche, the founder of Porsche Motor Car Company, and of course VW Motor Car Company. <coughs> the info I have, which is sketchy, and it's very difficult to get information on the Wolfsburg Trust, is that it was founded by Hans Porsche in the 30s, and of course it was under the nose of Hitler, but Hitler was not completely the maniac, at least in those days, that he been, has been portrayed to be. And he was rather hard-headed at that time, and his problems, that is Hitler's problems, of going off the deep end occurred apparently after 1941. But at that time, at least Hans Porsche made a trust fund, which he intended, as it accrued money, would be available after the, uh, at that time he saw the war coming. They said after the war, would be available for third world countries who wish to become democratic governments. They, they would hopefully have enough money to help these smaller countries to in, incorporate their own government on a democratic basis. At the time the father walked in that office, I didn't know how much money he had or where it came from, but since then I found out that the Wolfsburg Trust at its peak, which was around that period, had something over three trillion dollars in trust. Trillion, not billion. They definitely had the clout to help a few nations become independent. Well, Father said he would put up all the money, we'd incorporate. We did incorporate between January and March. We had the papers in the mill. 
And I filed for patents. I don't know if they were ever issued or not, or where they went because of what happened only two months later. In March of 1953, I went on one of the business trips when Jack was out of town taking care of business and such. I don't know whether it's company business or Navy business. He said he had to go out of town on business. Uh, I'm sorry, Air Force business. But he was out of town, and during that time of period, when I was sitting in the office one day, a team of black ops personnel just sent on me, seven of them. They grab me, take me out of the building in front of everyone, and off we go down to Washington, D.C., and from Washington, D.C., we am taken to McLean, Virginia, a special joint facility of both NSA and CIA. And as to, much to my surprise, not knowing anything much about this sort of thing, not expecting another return of what we had anticipated and gone through in the Philadelphia experiment, there they had a portal inside one of those buildings of the facility at McLean, Virginia, and I was kicked in it, and I wound up elsewhere. So what else was new? This one was definitely very new. We wound up, as I was told after arrival, on Alpha Centauri 1, one being planet number one in their system. And I was being interrogated by a group of near-human-looking beings, about six foot high. They had essentially human form. The facial features were not exactly human. They were rough. But in any case, they interrogated me for some four days. They wanted to know my history, what I had done, where I was doing. Of course, I wanted to know what the blazes I was doing there and what their interest was. Well, I had the feeling that my life hung on the balance and that if I wanted to get out of there, I'd better tell them everything. So I started with the Philadelphia Experiment. Of course, going in the Navy, the Philadelphia Experiment. Oh, yes, we know about that. And, uh, well, the time traveled. Oh, where'd you go? Well, I went to 2137. Mm, okay. Then I went to the 28th century. Then he got a little more interested. I told him about what I saw there and so forth, and they expressed uh, some passing interest. But I said I met a strange group there. I said, oh, was that? Uh, so the wingmakers, and I told him all about them. These guys absolutely went bonkers. They freaked out. And they said, you contacted who? And I said, a group that calls themselves the wingmakers. I said, you're going back. And they did something which I have learned since rarely ever happens. I was shipped back to the point of origin, namely that Navy, that uh, CIA NSA facility at uh, Fort McLean, Virginia. From there, I was sent back to the Pentagon. And the next thing I asked was, when am I going to go back to California? Nobody would give me an answer. And I kicked around the Pentagon for months, literally from sometime late March, that same day almost that I was taken out, oh, well, several days later because it was four days past in an office in Tari, which did not correlate directly with our time frame, was close. And I had nothing to do, no job to perform or report in daily, that's what I was expected to do, at a living quarters, could not see the family, was not allowed to. The last time I saw them was in 1952 when I snuck a visit to the family, finding out where they were at that time, out of California. So this went on for months, and I kept asking questions. Well, when am I going to be able to go back and do some work? I wasn't doing any work of any kind. Nobody would give me an answer. I finally went up to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and asked them, particularly the Navy, uh, don't know, we don't know what's going on, can't give you an answer. Uh, go away type of attitude. Not that rough a statement, but uh, that kind of attitude, like they wished I wasn't asking the questions because you don't get that gruff with somebody of the rank I had, which was then captain in the U.S. Navy. But they wouldn't give me an answer. Neither would they give me any bad treatment, neither did they give me any answers. And I stood there and I walked around there and worked a little bit now and then. Finally went to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and asked him what's going on and so forth. And he says, frankly, he says, I can't tell you. He says, I don't know. I said, well, I'd like to get back in the mainstream of the Navy. I'm a career man. I would like to finish my term. I would like to do what I'm expected to do, what I'm capable of doing. And he looked at me almost tearfully and says, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. And I will not forget those words, quote, it is out of our hands, unquote. Now, this is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And finally, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs saying, it is out of his hands. If it's out of his hands, whose hands was it in? Certainly not the President of the United States, under a military matter like this, who was probably totally unaware of the projects that have been ongoing. So where did it go? Well, it obviously went back to where I just returned from, Alpha Centauri. Before I left, 
uh, I should say before I was removed from the operation in our little facility on the beach, a group had started nosing around like they were interested in taking over our operation. And that is a group called the Cristaldi Research Group. I'll give a little info on that very briefly. But I remembered the name because at that point they were poking around after Father had also made his pitch and asking questions. And as I left, or was about to leave, the Alpha Centauri group, I happened to ask them, oh, do you know anything about the Gestalti Research Group? Oh yeah, we run them. And that uh, stuck in my craw for quite a while. It provided some answers and an analysis of what did finally happen to that company. Jack Reilly was removed in 1954. It was shut down. He tried to keep it going, but he could not keep it going very well alone. And when he was removed, nobody could. It was shut down, stood in, sat in limbo for years. Eventually, Hughes Research Corporation was formed, and they bought the property. It was in Malibu, in Malibu Beach area, about a half mile east of the beach. And it's very visibly there today, much expanded. But the original facility was in limbo for years, and nothing happened. Well, in the last year, I mean the last year of the last century, 1999, having not recalled up to that point of January any of this, what I've just described to you, I fell across a book in the Barnes & Noble bookstore entitled uh, The History of Mach 1. That was the title on the book. It was literally the history of the development of the Mach 1 plus aircraft at Edwards, then Muroc. I looked at it and said, oh, I know a little bit about this. I wonder what these people have to say about it. So I opened it, looked through it, and found some pictures, and uh, opened the book. And there I'm looking at a picture of five of the crew members or the associated crew for the Bell X-1. Chuck Yeager was in the middle, and on the right end was a man by the name of Jack Ridley. Well, I didn't know the name by the, when I looked at it. I recognized Jaeger, but really I recognized as I know this guy. Where is he from? What's the connection? I know I know him. I've never forgotten a face, no matter how much I've been brainwashed. And I recognized him, and I knew him from somewhere. It was that search from January of 1999 until approximately September, and then a lot of corollary research with, uh, let us say, internet searching, brought up some of the most interesting answers. Jack Ridley, of course, as I had described, was in the Air Force. He became part of that project. He was thrown out in 1954. The project collapsed, but on the history of his life, there's a huge gap on the Internet history of Ridley's life between 1948 and 1956. It's blank, completely. In 1956, he formed a company of his own entitled Ridley and Aeronautical Machines in Coral Gables, Florida. I don't know if it was successful or not. The net report didn't say. But in 1957, he flew to Japan to have a reunion, the 10th year reunion of the group for Mach 1 project. He crashed his plane. The public record says that he died in that crash. Of course, they had a big memorial thing for him. And the, uh, the tower at Edwards Air Force Base today is called Jack Ridley Tower as a result of that. But I have other information that says he didn't die in that crash, that he lived on. He survived the crash and was brought back to health slowly, but eventually died about uh, seven years later at Edwards. And I'm not even sure if that's a true report, but that was what I was told. And the other information, I guess, again, confidential, from very confidential sources, said that yes, he did die in 54, but then the time travel crews went back and pulled him out before he died. So here we go again into the area of uh, not merely time manipulation, but altering history. Pulled him out, probably gave him a brainwashing, because I've not met him since, and uh, put him back to work under his own name. Rumors were that he was back up in a <clears throat> Marietta, Georgia, at the Martin Marietta, which later became the uh, uh, Martin Lockheed Company, that he had been there. I could find no trace of him to going through the entire, shall we say, de Department of Personnel, all their records. Did they find a Jack Ridley? No. Nobody with that name here. We haven't run anybody by that name here, and so forth. He may have been there under a pseudonym. I don't know, but I've never found him. But the facts are <clears throat> that JRC Enterprises is alive and well. It is still in some manner functional. It is carried as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Cristaldi Research Group. <clears throat> now comes a question. Who is the Cristaldi Research Group? 
That was a question it took a great deal of effort to come up with any answers at all to. They were listed on the internet as uh, Cristaldi Research Group, offices in principal cities, offices in the Vatican, and uh, this sort of thing, and also that they were building a new facility on Long Island, a headquarters facility. More than one person was involved in the search for me, and one of them found out that it was quite obvious that the headquarters for Cristaldi was the Vatican itself, because two and a half centuries ago, a man by the name of Cristaldi, the Cristaldi family, was the treasurer for the Vatican. And that itself proved very, very interesting. They had large sums of money available. They apparently intervened at a time when there was some very original or event guide information being made being made available, research being done, such as we were doing with the ion propulsion engine. And we have found some interesting material. The project which we were on, we were trying to develop, was scuttled and buried for years. In the last few years, Cristaldi Research Group is now functioning at the University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, on the Mars colonization project. This is straight off the internet. And what this project entails is the developing of a elevator system from the surface of Mars to an orbiting stationary uh, vehicle which is, has supplies on board, transferring personnel, transferring objects, hardware, tools, whatever. And they would use an elevator, according to the plan, consisting of a carbon filament type structure, very strong, and an ion propulsion engine to run the elevator from the surface back up to the top and to control its descent. And, of course, Cristaldi is involved with this. So the project apparently has been resurrected. I have not yet been able to dig in there sufficiently to find out what I can find out, if anything. But I do intend to do so. Of course, several other ion propulsion engine projects have turned up in the meantime. There's a Kaufman engine. There are several others. I think NASA's gotten into it. There are rumors that Hughes themselves got into it back in the 60s and developed an ion propulsion engine for use aboard a B-52, perhaps to replace the, if sufficiently strong, or enough propulsion to replace the jet engines. That way, they could not do that. They found that out. And one of the limitations of a propulsion engine of that type, an ion propulsion, is about 2,000 pounds thrust under the theories which were then current. And I came up with a conclusion at that time that the math was incomplete and was not correct. Obviously not totally wrong because we made an engine work. But that as you increase the power up to a point like about 2,000 pounds thrust, the mathematics has an inbuilt error function, which will not allow you to get past about 2,000 pounds thrust. I was already past that, and I was ready to design an engine for 10,000 pounds thrust, which would have made a difference, not only in space, but in some of our military aircraft. Because the B-52, in the earlier versions at least, ran eight engines with 20,000 pounds thrust each. Currently, I believe they run about 30,000 pounds with water injection and a few other booster systems for takeoff power. B-52 is still being flown with eight engines of 30,000 pounds thrust. That's a lot of thrust. And, of course, we have the C-130, or the C-5A is the particular one I mean to refer to, using much larger jet engines today. And, of course, it's a very, very heavy craft. I don't know if that could ever be converted to ion propulsion engine because it's not intended to go to space anyway. But the project died. It may and be currently resurrected, but I've yet to find any definitive information about it. I did find enough to know that my recollection, JRC Enterprises, was quite correct. It's on the internet. Anybody can find it if they know where to look. You have to look at, for it on the Cristaldi Research Group, but it won't give you much of the history of what JRC Enterprises did, if any at all. A strange thing happens. The history of those developments and those activities which the establishment does not want on record for the general public as a way of disappearing. On the subject of time travel, I think a few comments are necessary, or at least desirable on my part. Many people cannot accept the idea of time travel. Many scientists, for that matter, cannot. They say it's impossible. But again, we get to that strange schism between, uh, pardon the expression, public science and private science. By public science, I mean that which is taught in the universities and is commonly accepted throughout industry and the trade. The private science being that which is restricted to only a few, to certain government agencies, to certain major private corporations that help build some of this hardware in secret. And there is a large gap, a large schism there. 
of them today, I think an average of 50 years. In reality, <clears throat> science and technology is about 50 years ahead of what is reported and taught in the uh, usual school systems and even the best school systems. With the idea that, as I have found, time travel is a reality, it actually was first uh, accidentally discovered in 1936. It goes back to a Navy expedition involving a brand new USS Kearsarge, uh, digging around in the South Pacific, north of the shores, uh, I'm sorry, the South Atlantic, north of the shores of, Atla of <clears throat> South America, perhaps on the fringe of the so-called Bermuda Triangle. They found a large crystalline structure on the floor of the ocean, sent divers down to examine it, the next thing they knew, the Eldridge, oh, sorry, it was too bad the Eldridge wasn't able to do it this way, uh, the Kearsarge disappeared. About two months later, it came back with a very strange explanation that it had time traveled into the future, and those people in the future realized what had happened, knew about the Atlantean installations, and showed them how to calibrate their system because these crystals were activated by a combination of, of electronic or actually RF and magnetic uh, energies of a certain combination, certain frequencies and so forth, that were key to turn this thing on. And they knew that the Atlanteans had built these ages ago when Atlantis was an empire that was traveling all over the world, moving heavy hardware everywhere. So they used them for transport of large and very heavy cargoes from point A to point B almost instantaneously. Didn't have to expend any fuel on it. It was a very quick and easy and very inexpensive transportation for very heavy loads. It was also usable, as uh, the Kearsarge found out, for time travel. They were told how they could calibrate the system, and by the end of two years of research, they figured out a system to utilize this system of crystals, which apparently on the ocean floor all over the U.S., uh, I'm sorry, all over the world, around the U.S. and around any other oceanic, uh, <coughs> ocean surrounded or ocean adjacent nation. So they found out that they could use this system for time travel. I don't know if they ever attempted to use it for just plain point-to-point -point travel. That I'm not aware of, but the stories I ran into and the information I had, which partly came out of the Los Alamos Laboratory's Black Vault, as did so much other things, was they found out how to calibrate it. They were able to use the Kearsarge and later a number of other ships, similarly outfitted with the appropriate equipment, for time travel into the future. And this allegedly according to my information, became essential to the winning of World War II against Nazi Germany. We had to pull some hardware out of the future, modify a few things, and even if you look at the end of the war, wherein we dropped a plutonium bomb as well as a standard uranium gun barrel type bomb on Japan, the one in Hiroshima was a uranium gun barrel bomb, and the one in Nagasaki by public statement was a plutonium bomb, one has to ask some very serious questions. Since in the record of the development of the atomic bomb, the test at Trinity Flats was stated in the manuals and the declassified information to be a plutonium bomb, and that it took all of the production of plutonium out of Hanford Engineering Works for over a year to produce enough plutonium, a bomb grade, that they could use to uh, test a bomb. They were so concerned about whether it would work or not, because they implied previous failures, which was true, they put a steel, a very heavy steel shell around the bomb in case it failed, that they wouldn't lose the plutonium, they could salvage it. Of course, it did happen that that particular device exploded quite well, left a nice glassy plating on the f desert floor, and was seen for many, many miles. But that took all of the plutonium that we had produced up to that time. How did we, within one month, get enough plutonium to build a bomb and drop it on Nagasaki? That has never been answered. And I think the answer lies in the fact that we had time travel capability and took some of the plutonium production out of the future where in the 80s and 90s and 70s even, we were able to produce it in rather large amounts, relatively speaking. The Russians over 40 years in one of their secret cities have built up a stock of 40 tons of bomb grade plutonium they don't know what to do with. And they're still producing it. So it's not that difficult to produce once you have the, the proper facilities. Other than that one specific instance, I'm told there were other instances of time travel being used to produce hardware in the future, that is our era, let us say the 80s, to be used during the period of World War II. The bottom line was we militarily defeated Hitler and the Axis powers and Japan, and the world settled back to an uneasy peace. 
This is a, shall we say, a small uh, inference, a small indicator of manipulating history. In this case, ongoing history, to make it come out the way we wanted it to come out, assuming all my data is correct. What about modifying history in the past to change the outcome in what is now the, our time? It was, of course, the future of, let's say, the period of the Civil War. What about doing something like that? Could it be done? And if it was, or could be done and was done, would we even know about it? Well, the answer to the last question is no. We would not know about it, because if you rewrote history by changing certain events in history, and the whole time field alters that portions of history after the event to correlate with what has been changed, so that it is a unified, connected, and cohesive whole, so to speak. And if you keep modifying history here, there, and everywhere, it's eventually you got into severe trouble, wherein the time field is at risk of collapse. I think, my own personal opinion I'm stating, I think this happened in the 94, 95 period because I was seeing evidence that time was getting very unstable. And there were some reports of some very strange effects in, at atomic clocks, which normally are accurate to one part and 10 to the 23rd or something of that order on the newest ones, one time 10 to the 14th or 15th on the older ones, was suddenly changing time by the matter of minutes in a matter of two weeks. Complete and total instability, if you will, in terms of the type of clock it was. These reports persisted, and I cannot say they're not true, and I cannot say they are true because I don't have any direct in inputs to those government circles wherein that information would be available. But information has a funny way of surfacing and a funny way of getting around through certain connected uh, links of information and information specialists. But that was one I definitely heard. Now, in terms of re-engineering history on a major basis, let us look at the Civil War. That is our American Civil War, 1861-1865. History books today record, of course, as everyone can read, the North won the war. It was a devastating war without question. We lost more troops in that war dead than all of the wars combined, including World War I and World War II. Over 550,000 dead, some one, I think 1 1.2 to 1.5 million injured. I'm not sure those figures are even accurate because they weren't keeping accurate figures at that point. History records we, the North, won the war against the South. The Southern states, of course, seceded. They had every legal right to do so. The war was not over slavery, it was over economic issues, and of course, that is fairly well known to those who have dug into it. But what is not well known is the fact that something strange happened about 1863. The South was winning the war, hands down, up until 1863. Every battle they engaged the North in, they won. And as the North noted, and the historians have noted the generalship was superb in the South, with half the hardware in terms of guns and other military hardware uh, that the North had, the South was able to beat the pants off of them. Then in 1863 it changed. Suddenly, I think it was the Battle of Antietam that changed, turned around, the North started winning. And of course they beat more and more Southern troops, Southern generals were changed. And there was a general retreat into the South, and of course then finally Sherman had his march to the sea in which they burned Atlanta and the South was defeated, according to the history books as we read today. The rest is history, I don't need to go into it. Suppose that were not what really happened in the first place. How would we possibly know it? How could we know it? Because if there was a change made in who won the war, then everything following on in the time field would be changed, except perhaps off-planet, or except perhaps in one other item, one other area which perhaps you might not give too much credence to, but it's worth investigating. What about people who lived through the Civil War, died, let's say, 1880, 1890, and were reborn and living today? What would they remember if you could probe their subconscious memories, their memories from past lives, and what would they say about who won the Civil War? I've heard a number of accounts, and I have one very good friend in Arizona, a lady friend, who has told me, <clears throat> In all of her psychic encounters and all of her memories that she has been able to pull out of her past life, she remembers living through the Civil War era. And when she died, it was her memory that the South had won the Civil War and that the capital of the new United States had been moved to Richmond, Virginia, and that there was literally a line of demarcation between the North and the South. It was never totally unified after that. 
Of course, that would be a disaster for history as we know it today if that had happened, because who knows whether the U.S. would ever have become a world power as it is now. But that is her memory. And I also have some friends who insist that they have taken part in time engineering projects, re-engineering history, that is, going back into the past and doing things which were perhaps in most cases minor modifications that wouldn't cause a great deal of impact on our current civilization, maybe very little, but were corrections of some kind or other. One of these friends insisted he was one of many teams sent back from what time period I've yet to find out. I've been able to nail it down and I haven't been able to talk with them that much. They were sent back several teams, male and female, into the year of about 1962, 1862, 1863, the Civil War, infiltrate the South and become part of the general staff <coughs> of the Southern armies and the Southern generalship. Uh, whether they were on General Lee's staff directly or not, I don't know, but they were well infiltrated. And then their function became not so obvious to the South, but obvious in terms of results. They gave this information to the Southern military leaders as to the contents of the Northern troops, uh, armaments, et cetera, et cetera, based on historical information they had been given from the future, if you will. And then the South started losing battles, one after the other. And finally, they, won, they no longer won the war. They had lost the war because of it. the history is re-engineered. Or so told, so told me this one friend who was part of one of the teams. I don't find that impossible. My own commentary on that is it's very possible because Lincoln, as president, was faced with a terrible quandary, and I certainly would not want to have been in his position. He was quite a humanitarian. He wanted to end slavery, and of course, slavery in the South actually was ending in any case. The war was not fought over slavery, but economic conditions. The South had already freed a lot of slaves, and many of the former slaves, black men, had become plantation owners and were hiring, if you will, black slaves. Slavery had been cut off by the English government in 1825. It was no longer legal to ship slaves on any English ship anywhere in the entire realm of England, which included the colonies or what were formerly the colonies in the United States. It was outlawed. The only ones left who were really engaging in slave trade at that time were the New England businessmen. Now, that sounds like a strange comment, but that is historically correct to the best of my knowledge. And they were engaging in it and keeping this going because it was an extremely lucrative business. A lot of money was made on it. But nevertheless, it was a failing institution before the war started. The South was disengaging from slavery. The North all long since had in practical aspects. But the war, of course, was still fought. And of course, one or the other one of them, the history records now, the North won it. We'll leave it at that because it has made the United States a very strong world power, and I certainly would not have wanted to have made some of the choices which Lincoln did. He instituted the first draft. He became the first president in history to have instituted the uh, function of the commander-in-chief and then, then declare a national emergency and start issuing executive orders. He was the first president in our history to do this. Every president since then has. They don't want to let go of that little piece of power which says they can write an order which overrides Congress and the Senate. And he instituted the tax laws, the first ones in the country. Of course, that resulted in major riots and were repealed. But a lot has changed in our history, and a lot has changed behind the scenes historically that we are not aware of. And this business of re-engineering history through manipulating of time may not be functional today because of problems induced by doing this to an excessive amount, but definitely has been done and has continued up to nearly the present time. Whether this will happen in the future or not, I don't know. Time travel still is functional, in spite of some people saying it is not, and some others saying it is totally impossible. I know the locations of some of the time operational equipment, time tunnels, if you will, but I'm not about to reveal them. I do have some respect for national security, in spite of what some people say. But I think my comments are quite sufficient. Time travel, from everything I've seen and having participated in it myself, including some of the trips to the past, I know it works. I know it's real. And it's something which perhaps the first time you do it is rather overwhelming to understand what you are doing and what is being done. It is not something which the average person will ever experience, would ever believe. And those who are participants are very carefully chosen. 